Hey, Patrick, can you hear me? What's up, man? Ready for <laughs> an hour or so here of some retention fun. How are you doing? How's, how's up there in Canada? Retention magic, baby. Uh, man, we're like plus 37, which is that's Celsius. So we're, um, we're actually really warm. warm. I know that, so that sounds cold to you. I don't know what the translation yeah. is, but that's like 96 or something. 37 C to F. That's what I, that's my Google. That's all I use. Google. Yeah. 99. <laughs> 8.6. Yeah. There you go. We are, body, body temperature. Salt, yeah. Basically body temperature. We're eighties right now in Salt Lake, but coast right now is like 100, 115, which is kind of funny. Crazy. Well, I'll take it. We were plus six last week. We got a ton of people joining in here. I'm going to give it a couple minutes. Um, we are, this was uh, just for those of you on, um, go over a couple quick house rules really quick. We got one of the greatest minds here in retention. He never cancels anything because he is <laughs> actually, you must really think about it every time you cancel a subscription for something like, what did they do wrong? Why am I canceling this? <laughs> I do uh, think about it. Yeah. But that's, so, that's an interesting comment. I've never heard that one before. I like it. Is your, um, Hang on one second. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I can see you. Um, people are piling in here. We've got over 300 people registered, which is which is really cool to see. Um, we are streaming this on uh, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter looks like it broke. So the, the, the stream on Twitter is Classic. not working to my knowledge, but <laughs> our, uh, yeah, you'd think they would get that right. They own Periscope, right? That should be a simple thing, but... Um, I will probably have, we'll probably re uh, tweet our YouTube on there as well too. So wherever you're watching it, feel free to ask questions, um, post it in the comments, reply to a tweet. I've got a feed in here that I can see everything. And so, um, post your questions and I will drill Patrick on air and make him look either like a fool or a genius. Great. And, uh, <laughs> one or the other. But uh, this is, we're going to go through some, some retention and churn, um, some metrics and some numbers. And, um, but we also want this to be live. So if you have questions, uh, uh, post them in there as well. Um, Patrick was lying in the comments. It is being recorded. <laughs> so, and uh, we will send it out to everyone that attends. Um, is that someone saying they are not seeing a, they are seeing a screenshot. One second here. They shouldn't be. Give me one second here. Da, da, da. It should be good. Yeah, everything looks good on my end. Thumbs up in the chat if you can hear and see us. Someone throw a thumbs up or two. I'm just checking with my... Yeah, I can see those. and hear both of you. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, we're, good. Uh, good. we're good. And I'm just going to throw this up as well here. Now, bam. Okay. Perfect. We're getting, Oh, look at these thumbs up. Okay. Um, whoever can't hear us, maybe your volume's down. <laughs> so, um, I can't remember what I was saying. Um, yes. We, if you have questions, um, post them wherever you are, Emma, I'm sorry. You can't hear us. I don't know why. Um, but, um, yeah, so a lot of this is, is for, for you to ask questions while we have Patrick here. Um, but also we're going to dive through, we, we recently put out a, um, uh, subscriptions trends report, uh, that had a lot of really interesting information on, on retention churn and that we think a lot of you guys can, can get some from. So, um, let's quickly, Patrick, do you want to, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? I, I think uh, probably a lot of people here know who you are, but a little quick background on on you and why people should care. Yeah, totally. I don't know if anyone should care, but uh, <laughs> if you if you do, um, so Patrick Campbell and CEO founder of a company called ProfitWell. Um, we do what's called subscription revenue automation. 
Uh, so the idea is you plug in to profit well and basically um, you make money. We automate revenue. And the way we do that is we attack a different, a couple of different pieces um, of your growth, um, one of which is retention, which we're talking about today. So we have a product called Retain that takes care of a lot of the mechanical aspects of retention, which I'm sure we'll get into things like term optimization, credit card failures, those types of things. And where a lot of our knowledge comes from is we have a free product um, that you can plug in your billing and basically get access to your your, your financial uh, reporting. And that's used right now by about 20 to 25% of subscription companies out there. So a lot of data, a lot of benchmarks. Uh, most of the time, what I like to say is, um, you know, don't, don't trust in me, don't care about me, but, you know, I'll bring the data um, as well as like what's working and what's not in the market. So happy to be here and hopefully happy to, uh, to give you some different ways to think about things and ultimately um, give you give you the ability to, to hopefully implement some things really quickly to help with your retention. Awesome. And we posted a link with all of our fancy tracking parameters on there so we can tell you exactly how many people clicked it <laughs> when they hit your site. No, you'll be able to see. There we go. Uh, feel free to change those parameters to something like, like Pat is handsome, so it shows up in his <laughs> uh, Google <laughs> Analytics reports. Nice. People will, where did this? track them just my friend jay uh awesome yes pat's been um and i would just add to what pat said is if anyone wants amazing content and to be inspired uh join his email lists um our marketing team loves the content you put out it's actually it's actually really really quality really well done um really well researched and it quite often gets shared around our office um and i don't read a lot of emails I get, but uh, honestly, when when a profit well email comes, it's uh, it's always worth reading because it's always got good substance. So I would encourage everyone to to uh, sign up for Pat's email. It's one of the good ones. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if you don't know who I am, I I'm Jay. I'm one of the founders here at Bold. I think you know we signed up a lot of people on this webinar. So. Uh, you probably know what Bold is, unless you came through the ProfitWell channels. But um, Bold, we are a we're, we're a checkout experience company. So, but we we build software for e-commerce platforms that revolves around the checkout experience, and uh, subscriptions is a big part of that. So, we we look at the whole aspect though of subscriptions, not just as we say slapping on a subscribe and save. It's the subscription experience before during the check the conversion, during the checkout, and then post checkout during the relationship. And getting all of that right is really what um, creates an amazing subscription experience. And that's part of running a good subscription program. Um, there's lots that happens after the purchase, which we're going to get into today. Um, but that's a little bit of a nutshell what we do at Bold. And this, uh, the reason we're actually, what we have Pat on here is we put out a uh, report recently we just it's called our 2021 subscription trends it's not so much a report as it is a drivers of success study so we we have around 20,000 brands using uh, bull subscriptions and we looked at all of them we personally surveyed and talked to 800 of them and tried to pull out data that successful brands were doing and 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 make um not comparisons draw draw results from it by looking at okay these brands are offering a free trial or this x discount or doing this for retention or this for loyalty points and then we looked at their churn and tried to draw correlations out of that so um, we compiled all that into this book and um, patrick contributed to this with uh, a few great quotes um, in there as well so we brought him on to talk to the sections that were all about retention and churn so uh and yes the link that book that uh, report is free you can uh grab that in there and feel free to change the parameters to jay is handsome in source or medium <laughs> not jay is ugly because i'll uh it's just joking if anyone doesn't They'll do like google analytics much. they're gonna like what that what the heck is he talking yeah, about what is this guy talking about yeah oh yeah i hope he knows something about churn and retention because so yes so that is what we're diving in today so um Actually, before we get started too, if you're, most of you will probably be watching in Crowdcast here, uh, you can post questions in the chat, that's cool. We'll try to skim up through there. Um, you can also ask them, there's a little ask question feature, uh, and that's cool because then once we answer it, we can mark it answered and it's a little bit easy for us to, to filter, but 
if you ask them in the chat, we'll try to address them as well too. So, so churn, Patrick, is uh, a dirty word, is it? No, <laughs> you can't avoid you can't avoid it though. No, absolutely. I think um, yeah. It's, to take us, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna go ahead. Why does it matter? Yeah, I think I, I think the big thing, and you know, some of you listening or watching now, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of questions around like churn subscription cancellations you probably know something but it, i want to take a quick step back to kind of you know answer this question properly um the beauty of the subscription model um the recurring revenue model if you will is that it's the first commerce model in the history of 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 you know humankind basically where it bakes the relationship with the customer into how you make money and it's a bit of a subtle change, but it's a really, really important change because instead of having to convince your customer through some sort of coupon or discount to come to, you know, your grocery store or your e-commerce store, you know, every single week or every single month in order to to purchase whatever they're purchasing, you have a, a basically a, a opted in customer every single month or every single quarter or week, depending on how you set up your subscription. And I think the reason that this is so important is because when you start to realize that you start to think from that first principle, you have to realize like, of course, people are going to cancel. And if I'm not taking things like cancellations, if I'm not taking how long that customer sticks around into consideration, you end up kind of running a mismatched playbook. And what I often see with, you know, a lot of e-commerce brands that are going into subscriptions, but even with, you know, B2B SaaS brands and even consumer subscription brands is that they, they end up running kind of an old school commerce playbook, a corner store style playbook, where it's like, I only make money when I email people and send them a discount for, you know, over generalization, rather than running the growth playbook for subscriptions, which is, having a ton, a ton of investment and in acquisition, obviously, because you got to pay the Facebook tax, right? But in addition to that, making sure that you're monetizing and pricing properly, and then ultimately focusing in on that relationship by having really, really good retention. So it's a fact of life, but it's not something that's necessarily quote unquote hard. Um, it, it has some difficulty and some effort that is required to have really good retaining customers, but it just means you have to make sure you're running the playbook that fits the actual model that you're doing. So it's a little bit of a, a, a soapboxy, you know, kind of entry into this discussion, but I think it's really, really important to start from that, that core first principle. I agree. And I think it's, um, I would only want to say too, that to set the stage, like, churn is it's going to happen it's not horrible it's part of running a subscription business and even making the churn experience um not enjoyable but like it, it there, there used to be this uh mindset that like make it almost impossible to cancel a subscription i think we're past those days yeah um but it's 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 understanding that it's it's going to happen um it doesn't it doesn't mean um having a a retention of five years because a customer can't cancel or they don't know where or they don't have a, that's not healthy either. Um, so, uh, le so then let's dive into actually, I want to read this first. Um, this was one of the quotes that you had in our book. Uh, I'm going to just read it. And then I want to dive a little bit into voluntary involuntary churn. Um, and I liked this quote. You said, you know, ultimately churn and subscription can cancellations come in two categories, strategic, which is voluntary churn and mechanical which is involuntary churn. It's death by a thousand paper cuts and you need to actively and strategically work through each of these paper cuts over time. Um, what, to talk about this a little bit. What, is, what does this mean? Yeah. So when you think about your cancellations, there's, there's a lot of reasons why someone will cancel, right? So when we think about cancellations and churn, oftentimes our mind goes to, well, if the product was good enough and the customer was right, they would stick around forever, right? Well, that's kind of not, not true, but it's incomplete, right? Because that basically assumes that every single person is going to be similar into why they're leaving or why they're staying, right? And so these two big buckets, one is kind of strategic. These are things like, um, I didn't like the color of the item that I got. I didn't like, um, you know, I didn't get good answers to support. I didn't get, um, you know, I have too much product. That's a really common thing that ends up popping up. These are kind of like the paper cuts that it takes a really good kind of product team, really good like merchandising team, uh, depending on your type of business to, to eventually just improve over time. 
And to give you some context in, in any given business, particularly like a subscription e-commerce business, which I know a lot of people on here are today, um, you're looking at probably about half, if not 60% of your cancellations come from this bucket. And it varies depending on price point and vertical and things like that, but that's kind of a, a general rule. But that means you have this other bucket that's very mechanical that makes up about 40 to 50% to of your overall cancellations. And these are things that are very, very solvable. These are things like credit and payment failures, um, term optimization, like I discussed before, doing what's called our salvage offers, which we'll talk about in a bit. But the basic idea is the reason we separate these things out is because everyone fixates on the strategic piece, which you should, but that's kind of a lifelong journey to solve over the history of your company, like finding the right product and, and kind of the right customer fit. Whereas the mechanical pieces, these kind of you know things that you can tactically improve, those are the easy yeah. quote unquote things to solve right now. Okay. So can I dive into each of those a little bit on the, let's, 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 let's talk on the mechanical. Um, what did you call it? Salvage, salvage strategy. There's a couple of, there's a couple of things you can do. These are things like first payment failures is probably the, the easiest one for everyone to kind of latch on to. Um, about 20 to 40% right now of, of lost customers. So it's the single largest bucket of, of lost customers typically comes from it's payment crazy. failures. Um, it's wild. Yeah. And, and, and most of the time um, you, you're not going to get all of these people back, but if a hundred people have their credit card failed, you should be able to get 50 to 80 of them back. Um, most companies are only getting 20 to 30 of them right now. So you should be able to double mm -hmm. your recovery right now, um, if not more. Um, but that's a really, really big one. And that's kind of where we started in analyzing the data and building product to kind of solve this type of stuff was because we were like, holy cow, this is like the largest bucket. Um, then there's things like uh, term optimization. So what I mean by this is... Um, a lot of you are only using monthly subscriptions, but things like quarterly, six month and annual subscriptions, depending on your product, those all don't make sense. Uh, those retain at a much higher rate because obviously it's one purchasing decision per three, six or 12 months versus one purchasing decision every single month. Um, so to give you some numbers here, uh, typically um, like an annual customer will retain at a 30% higher rate than a monthly. Uh, quarterly is closer to about 20 to 23% right now. Um, so one tactical thing you can do, and I'm more than happy to go deeper into this, is just ask your customers once they've experienced your product, hey, do you want a longer term plan for you know $10 off or you get this special item or a whole host of things you can do? Um, and then the third bucket I mentioned were salvage offers, which is basically kind of what you were alluding to, which is, hey, when someone's trying to cancel, there's a whole host of reasons they're trying to cancel. And some of those you can't control at all. Like, again, you don't have the right product mix or something to that effect. But there's a lot of people who like, oh, I didn't get a chance to use it. Oh, I didn't get a, you know, I didn't, I have too much product, whatever it is. And in those situations, I should be doing something um, like a pause, like, hey, can I pause that subscription? Or in some cases, if they say like, I didn't have a chance to use it as much and you don't want to do a pause, you can maybe offer them, you know, hey, we'll give you one month at $10 off to stick around, right? So this is like a salvage offer, like I'm trying to salvage the relationship. Um, yeah. And what's really kind of fascinating is you can lower your active cancellations by, you know, somewhere between 10 and 30%. Um, we've seen in the subscription e-commerce space, just by offering these same offers that you're giving to your new customers, basically giving similar offers um, to those customers who are trying to leave you. Um, but most of the time, again, you're spending so much time and so much budget, you know, obviously trying to fill your funnel. You don't think about this, like, customer who already knows you. So they're a lot cheaper to keep than obviously acquiring that new customer. So those are like three really big buckets um, that I always recommend that kind of take care of the tactical side of retention. And most of the time, if you take care of those three, um, your, your lifetime value is going to go up significantly anywhere between 20 to 50%. Um, we've seen just by doing okay at those three things, let alone being good at those three things. And it's like a snowball effect because <clears throat> if you think about what you spend to acquire a customer, if you spent, if you said, I'm going to take even, even like a third of that budget to retain customers. Yeah. Now, now those cut, now your customers actually become more valuable because you're increasing mm. the lifetime value. It actually then allows you to spend more to acquire customers because you have more valuable customers. And so it's a net, you win on both ends. 
Yeah. Um, it's, uh, but I, but it's one of those things where, uh, you know, brands often they're just, they've, they've mastered the top of the funnel, getting the customers in the acquisition yeah. part is like all that they show in reports. And that's, those are their key metrics every quarter, their sales, but yeah. they don't have key metrics of what did we churn this quarter? Or did our turn get better? But well, and it's I just would as never, important. Yeah, I would never change that that focus because that is kind of going to be the number one priority, right? For a brand is, you know, we found like e-commerce brands, they spend between 70 and 80% of their overall budgets. Um, and this is a median. So there's you know some who spend more, some who spend less on acquisition, basically. Um, and a lot of that's ad spend, right? Yeah. Um, and what's really fascinating about that is, is you know, that's, that's where the hardest thing is probably kind of long term because CAC is going up across the board. Everything's getting so dense. But the thing with subscriptions is it's it's a multi move game, right? I go back to kind of my soapbox in, in, in the beginning here where it's not about that first month. Like that first month is great. Don't get me wrong. That's the start of the relationship. But it's about all the subsequent months that come. And if you spend a little bit more time on this, this part of your business, it has pound for pound, much, much higher results um, than similar kind of means um, in the world of acquisition because we're already spent so much time and so much effort on the part of the business. Yeah, which let's throw up this next slide here. Um, you put out a blog post recently uh, on the top eight causes of churn. And, uh, I thought th this, this really, uh, this, I found this really interesting. So I'd like to kind of go through some of them, you know, I'm going to, eh, what's the best way to do this here? Do you want me to throw them up each at a time or throw them all up and you can kind of highlight some of the key ones that yeah, let's throw them all up. Some okay. of them I already talked about, which is good. Yeah. So let's click right. Okay. So here's, um, and actually is the link, uh, someone from our, our team throw the link in the, uh, in the comments here, because this is a, I think a blog post worth, worth reading. Um, yeah. cause, cause you dive into each of these, but, um, are any of these stand out to you as you just hit yourself over the head? Cause like brands consistently get this wrong, or maybe are some of these like really easy wins that brands could do to like, if you, if you said like, what's the lowest hanging fruit I can focus on to improve. Um, yeah, that's so these are these. Yeah, totally. So we talked about, I would say, the lowest hanging fruit, which is like credit cards and the other things that we mentioned. Um, th those are the most frustrating because those are mechanical things you can do. It's not like, hey, let's go figure out how to like get the right customers and all these other things. But the rest of these, the, the top seven here are, um, and, and, and this is all the strategic side of things. And what I mean by that is, you know, you have to imagine this flywheel that you're building of acquiring customers, monetizing and retaining them and so on and so forth. You have to kind of like think if you get garbage in, you end up getting garbage out, right? Mm -hmm. So you know this probably very, very much, or you being the folks on the call, like you very much know this from the acquisition side, right? So if you get the if you get bad traffic, oh my gosh, it's great. We increase our traffic 50%, but if that traffic's just not great, it's not gonna end up converting. And the same kind of holds true on the retention side. Um, sometimes you're just going after the wrong type of customers. And what's kind of scary in the world of e-commerce is that it feels like they're the right customers because they're doing the initial purchase, but they're not sticking around. And if you don't connect mm -hmm. the data inside your business, you're only focused on what you were saying, Jay, which is looking at those top of the funnel numbers. Inevitably, what ends up happening is, is that you don't even realize is that they're not great for your business. Um, and I've seen that time and time again, where you know the ROI just doesn't always work out, especially brands that get heavily funded because all of a sudden they're not connecting all of the dots. I think some of the other things here um, and, or a bigger notion when it comes to like outcomes or competitor perception, uh, bugs, um, value, these types of things, this all kind of is encompassed in the whole concept of you know your customer seeing value in your product enough to come in and you know stick around and i think that's such a nebulous concept mm -hmm. i almost like don't want to say it because it's like well how do you measure value well we can measure willingness to pay we can do things like that but the better idea is you know something about your brand you know something about your customer but are you communicating continuously the value or reminding the person of the value the customer of the value that they're getting 
oftentimes what I end up seeing kind of throughout this journey, kind of, you know, in the same spirit of only looking at that initial purchase and up to that initial purchase, everything looks great inside the funnel, the ad, the landing page, the initial email experience. But then all of a sudden, it's almost like, you know, the bill collectors coming or, you know, it's just a transactional relationship after that, because I'm not getting any moments of delight in terms of engagement. I'm not like the box isn't great. Like there's all these little areas that when you're delivering a product and when you're actually trying to keep that customer around, you can keep reinforcing that value. And something tactical here that, that I saw um, or I've seen work really, really well is some folks, they, they kind of game this a little bit by providing incentives to get to a particular payment or a particular month. Um, so Gillette does this really, mm -hmm. really well where, um, you know, they're trying to take on obviously Dollar Shave Club and Harry's and all of the other, you know, subscription, um, you know, men's and shaving products out there. What they do is they basically say, hey, your fourth shipment, whether it's monthly or quarterly, or um, I think those are the only two options, is basically free. And so what's kind of cool mm. about that is what they're doing is they're trying to do really good communication throughout those subsequent shipments, but then they're also basically providing an incentive to the customer to basically say like, oh, well, I already have my two shipments. I might as well just get the third so I can get the fourth free. And then there's a little bit of like, well, now I'm so baked into Gillette, I might as well continue my subscription and maybe adjust the frequency or things like that. And so Ultimately, it does come down to value, um, but it is one of those things that there's so many tactical things you can do to make sure that that customer sees value from communication all the way to kind of structuring how your subscription works um, to kind of keep that customer around and, and seeing that value over time. I, I don't think it's a uh, hokey pokey at all. I think it is core. <laughs> I think, what was the word? Um, it's just hard it's, to measure, you know, it's just hard to it's measure, measure but for people. I heard um, I had uh, Robbie Coleman Baxter on our uh, she she speaks a lot on subscriptions and yeah. uh, had her on the podcast a while ago and I really liked her analogy she has this analogy of um, like a, a club uh, and you're in the beginning you're excited just to get in um, because you're waiting at the door and the bouncers like you're waiting to get in VIP entrance and some you know someone someone gets you in and that is exciting and then um, that club has to kind of make the onboarding experience good. You get in and then you're excited to be in there. Your the mu music is good. good. You enjoy the dance floor, whatever. And that's the operational aspect of the club. Um, and then on the, on the far end, um, but there, there, there comes a point where you get tired of the drinks, you get tired of the music, you get tired of the environment um, and your need as the the value that you require as a subscriber to stay engaged is always growing. Um, and so I think there's two things that I pull from that. And it's like, just to what you're saying is you have to nail, understand what the value is at every point and your subscribers that subscribed on day one, aren't going to be, uh, aren't going to stay for the same value that they subscribed on month 12. Mm -hmm. um, so increasing the benefits, the perks, the access, the whatever you give them, um, loyalty, rewards, partner bonuses, um, it needs to increase over time. So yeah. um, I think it gets she's key. always she's always so much better at the metaphors and anecdotes than I am. I'm the data sledgehammer. She's 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 the good stories, which I like. <laughs> I'll get I'll get you guys both on a on a webinar one time, and there we go. she can give the ideas, and you can be like. This is how you do it. This is the backup so, with data. So um, it can be a little peanut butter and <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this, I'm just wondering if there's any others. Th there was a few here too, like attracting the wrong customers. One thing I wanted to add to this, I see a lot of, um, one thing I've noticed lately and I've really been speaking on is um, I think one of the healthiest channels for new customers is actually through your existing ones. Um, and so through, through referrals, and that's just one that I wanted to call out on, on this post here was, um, you can pay to acquire customers as much as you want. They'll eventually get to a point where you, you churn X amount and you're onboarding X amount and your growth kind of flatlines. But if your acquisition channel comes through existing customers, and if you get to a, uh, viral coefficient that works you know, if you have 15% churn and every customer refers 1.2 customers, you can break out of that curve. And it actually, the more customers you get, the faster you grow, 
and it's a self-growing machine, but you have to have a really well thought out referral program. Um, and not just a, here's a link to get share it with someone, get 10% off. But, you know, like I tell brands, like, you know, give them three links maybe that they can share with only three people that they get like a month entirely free or some really, really good, good benefit. Kind of like what clubhouse did. Like mm-hmm. you got five invites and that was it. And you would have thought, well, if I could invite more people, clubhouse would grow faster, but they actually probably grew faster because they had less invites and you had to think I'm only going to give this to people that will use it. So, um, that one, I think it's, you're attracting the wrong customers and, and how they're coming in, I think makes a really big difference. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, let's jump to this one. Um, <clears throat> so looking at this, um, should not be a shock. I, I don't think. Um, but what, what this is saying, this is one of the, data points was essentially that um, brands that had been around longer uh, see less churn. So 42% of brands that have been around for two years or more see one to five, and then 58% of brands two years more actually see one to one to three. Um, This, uh, this I think was was monthly churn. Um, And so that makes sense. Brands, of course, like the longer they've been around, they see less churn. But then my question goes to, the why on this, like why, what do those brands know? What are, what are they getting right? Uh, and how can maybe someone listening um, fast track that? Like what are, what, are the, what are the mistakes that some of the uh, brands in the first year are making that they figure out that now these brands two years later, uh, is there anything that, you know, people watching today can do to kind of skip the first year and get numbers like brands are in the <laughs> two plus? <laughs> No, I, I actually don't think so. I think, you know, this is this is kind of it's a little survivor bias here, right? Like and it's one of those things where um in your first couple of years, like think of, you know, if it's a new brand, like a fresh new brand, not like an offshoot brand, um, all of a sudden you're living in a world where there's just you're you're trying to find your audience, right? And you're just trying to find, you know, you're trying to get hone mm-hmm. like where your traffic's coming from, who is the best type of customer. You're, you're trying to put everything together. And, and this is kind of, in the SaaS software world, we call this like trying to get to product market fit, right? And I think that, mm-hmm. I don't think that that is used um, in, in the subscription e-commerce or e-commerce world, but it's like a similar vibe where you're trying to find, you know, after going through this messy like ups and downs, like some months are good, some months are bad. You're trying to basically find like, okay, so these are my good yeah. customers. And the other thing that ends up happening is, is that you start getting, um, you know, customers who are, who are just hooked, right? And they stick around for a long time. They start buying more of your product. Hopefully they start bringing in some of their friends like you're talking about. And you start getting this nice little flywheel of just like better customers kind of replicating themselves. And frankly, that's that's honestly the goal of the subscription world is you want to kind of like clone your customers, right? Because that's where that compounding growth gets. And you were kind of commenting on this before with the referral kind of programs as well. But I think the best way to skip ahead is have the tactical slash mechanical things taken care of as soon as possible, right? Because I don't know if you can figure out, you know, with customer research, you can figure out a lot of it, who your best customers are, but there's still going to be a little bit of a messy period in the beginning. But if you have your tactical Mm -hmm. stuff figured out, you're not going to lose customers for stupid reasons like payment failures, and you're going to get folks on longer term plans with the right promotion. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth, rather than like wasting a bunch of money in the early days, um, trying to figure out the core offering. And then all of a sudden, like not having those extra dollars um, from, from kind of taking care of the mechanical pieces. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think, I think, uh, yeah, that's a good way to look at product market fit. Like you're, you're, and what they say in the software industry is be as close as you possibly can to your early customers. Like yeah. don't, um, don't, don't build walls in the sense of like, you know, here's my support forum, go talk, go find there or submit a, this. Like it's like phone your first thousand customers that order from you, or maybe your first couple hundred, whatever you, whatever you can physically do, ask them how it was, was the, how was the box? Are, is the product useful? Is, do the, do you understand how to manage your subscription? Does it make sense? What did you stumble anywhere? Um, so you maybe could speed it up a little bit just by being a little proactive in engaging your your yeah. first your first thousand customers. Um, but other than that, I agree. It's it's finding it's fine tuning the product, 
the message, the 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 mechanics of the subscription program, um, and then well, and then is, scaling once you have that all figured out. Yeah, and this is also what's really frustrating about like I I'm on a mission, and there's no reason people would naturally like want to do this or see this, but I'm on a mission to like have as much cross pollination between like b2b SaaS companies and subscription e-commerce companies because like yeah they're they're both doing the things that the other should be doing right which is and, and the one mm -hmm. thing is is like it's it's like market research is not perfect it is not meant to be like a scalpel it's meant to basically like take giant swaths of um you know indecision or uncertainty off of like the the wider you know kind of mission of figuring out who you are what your product is these types of things but a lot of people and, and what's really fascinating is market research was kind of pioneered by the the retail world as well as like the um you know the physical product world but for some reason and to give you an example actually um part of the reason or, or one of our first customers was hallmark and the greeting card company and they have a hundred people just doing research like consumer mm. insights, all kinds of fun stuff. And the the world of software has like none of that. But for some reason, like modern subscription e-commerce companies, they'll do prototyping and like qualitative research. But the best out there um, are folks who are doing not only that, but they're also doing a lot of customer research. And the reason most of us don't do it, I think, is because we kind of we have bad perceptions of research because we have like crappy Henry Ford quotes that Henry Ford probably never said. Um, you know, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Right. <laughs> um, the thing about Ford that you don't realize is that mm -hmm. after that quote was supposedly said, and he probably actually didn't say it, um, all of a sudden uh, GM smoked Ford by basically not asking customers what they wanted, but asking customers about their pain points, their wishes, their values, all of these different things, and then filtering that information through their product minds and coming out with, oh, people like different colors because they want to look different than their neighbor's car. Well, Ford was like the only color you can get is black. And then GM came out with other colors and models and GM ended up being like the dominant you know, car manufacturer. Um, and so, Long story short, that's my little soapbox on customer research and that quote, because I hear it all the time when I advocate for customer research. But the basic idea is if you do some of that, a little bit of that, it can actually speed off and, and shave months off of your development because you're not, you know, you're still going to have to make the big decisions where you earn your paycheck, but ultimately you're able to kind of like hone down where your market is as much as possible. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, You'll like you'll like this one. You're gonna you, I'll give you an. You've probably heard this before, but I. Um, it's uh, to me, it's the question of um, if you're selling a hammer, <clears throat> you ask your customer like, how what kind of hammer do you want? Um, and then it's all about selling the hammer. But then uh, you might you find out what the customer actually wants. Does do they want the perfect hammer or do they want the nail in the wall? And actually, do they want the nail on the wall or do they want to hang a bookshelf and actually, is it really that they need a bookshelf or do they just want a place to put their book? And so when you get to the pr actual problem and that's what yeah. GM did. So, so I think Ford's question was a good question. Like if I asked them what they wanted, they would have said a black horse, like the customer might've said, I want a better hammer, but what they really want is a place to put their book. And that's up to the person understanding, really understanding the problem versus very surface level what they're trying to do at that exact moment so um well, that's where the struggle it, is I, too. like the struggle yes is, like you your job is to struggle with these questions not to seek like a perfect answer and the way you struggle with it is lots of debate internally doing some research talking to people qualitatively and then making decisions right and seeing how it works and, and then adjusting over time and so yeah i like i like that metaphor as well i've heard i've heard a similar one to that before so then to take that back to the subscription space, I think if, uh, if, um, you know, you, you, your first thousand customers, if you can figure out like, um, how they're managing, like maybe the, if, if a pain point they had was, uh, managing a subscription or I don't know, whatever, it doesn't have to be in your head. You might be trying to optimize this page, but maybe they want to do it by SMS. Maybe they want to do it by email. They don't even want to log in. Maybe they just want a, an email that goes out before the subscription that says, 
pause or everything is good or snooze a week or, you know, um, when you get to the actual pain point, um, I think you can pr probably increase retention quite a bit. Um, yeah. yeah, I think anything else on, on, on this slide, maybe speeding up the two years or that's it. Hard work, hard work, talk to, <laughs> talk to customers, talk to customers, talk to understand the market, understand who your best customers are and then find more of them. I think is, uh, is what the stores bigger than or older than two years have done. Right. hundred percent. So this was something else you said in our book. You said growth is much more effective if you're focusing on more than just acquiring customers. What the heck does that mean, Pat? Yeah. Well, we talked about this a, a bit already, but um, it's it's it, it's in the subscription world. You know, you're you're living in a world where it's more than just that first move. It's a multi-move game. You want to keep them around. Um, but I think that it's more than just retention, which we've talked a lot about. So just a little side note on monetization. I think that, you know, your customers, once you've once you've acquired them, you want them paying you more over time. And you do that through add-ons, you do that through more premium versions of the product, more volume, a whole host of things. But it's also making sure your pricing is is proper. And we had a question in in the chat here about how can a product being too cheap lead mm. to a customer churning, and the reason is is because um, your price is a measure of perception, right? So, what I like to tell people is is you know if you think about your product, you've created some sort of value, and because we don't trade you know goat for wheat anymore in the economies that we play in, we're pegging a currency amount to that value that we've created. Well, if I come to your product and you're claiming to be a luxury watch subscription and I'm going to be able to try on the best watches and if I want to purchase them, I can or I can return it next month and you're $50 a month, I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to like convert, right? And so it's a really, really big thing where you want to make sure that you're priced appropriately for the customer you're going after, but also make sure that you're setting things up to expand that revenue over time in addition to all the retention stuff that we talked about. And I always want to like preface or, you know, I guess epilogue here. Um, the big thing to kind of keep in mind is you're still going to spend the most money and the most time on acquiring customers. It's just a fact of life, but it's just making sure that these other areas of growth are also improving, maybe not at the same rate because they're a bit harder than, you know, just throwing up new ad campaigns and things like that, although that is definitely difficult, but it's one of those things where you want to make sure that you're attacking all areas of growth, not just one area of growth. Mm -hmm. Um, I think like on the topic of, um, pricing like i i read i can't remember if you had an ebook or something like it was like growth through your pricing model and um you you talk a lot about this about like your value based pricing and pricing as a pricing as a growth lever um yep. is there any play in that in the product subscription space like now you're talking you're talking about like growth strategies for saas recurring companies um any ways that a product recurring company can leverage some of those same tactics? Yeah, hundred um, percent. A lot of the tactics are, are very similar. Um, there's a couple that, you know, don't cross over. These are things like, you know, when you're selling a product like bold, for instance, there's a lot more flexibility on how you can charge because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an experience that you're tied to that has different metrics. Mm -hmm. But if you have a physical product, um, there's normally it involves like, a couple of axes sell more product right so you saw dollar shave club move to and i use them just as an example because you know um you know everyone kind of knows them i'm sure there's some shaving subscription on the call today who's just like cringing every time i use them <laughs> but um you know they went and started selling different product right so they started sh selling shaving cream on top of uh, then the butt wipes, right? Which was, you know, their second popular video and these types of things. So it's like selling additional or different product. The other axis is premium version of the current product. So they have, mm. you know, the baseline model and then they have the really premium model. And then, um, you know, sim like, well, so then there's like more volume, right? So do I want more razors from this case? And like, those are three axes that you can use. And then there's a bunch of other little things that you can do as well, such as, um, you know, basically uh, like uh, 
localization, for instance, um, you know, Canadian consumers are willing to pay different amounts for different products than U.S. consumers. Um, and depending yeah. on where you're selling into, you have shipping constraints depending on your business. But there's a lot of different things you can do to basically increase that revenue per customer over time. And it really comes down to getting expansion revenue. So I always recommend like the biggest thing you can do um, is have some sort of add on strategy, whether that's an additional product that you can sell um, on a monthly basis or even a one time basis, um, or it's a higher volume of the existing product they're getting. Doesn't make sense mm -hmm. for all products. Um, and then one kind of sneaky way that I think is going to get a lot more popular over time is having some sort of membership um, when it comes to your particular product. So the most extreme example here is something like Italic, um, which is, you know, kind of like a premium Costco membership where you have a membership, an annual membership, I think it's $100 per year, and then that gives you access to their goods. That's kind of like a gated phenomenon. But I'm seeing more and more brands basically have some sort of membership where they get additional discounts, you know, for being a member, they get access to new designs and things like that. Um, and they get, um, there's a couple of other things like shipping is prioritized always, these types of things. And what's kind of beautiful about that is as you build that member revenue, um, you know, it's not necessarily pure profit, but it gets pretty close, um, particularly because a lot mm -hmm. of those things that you can give away are kind of things you'd already give away anyways. And what we found is that members typically their AOV um, on any given month basis is typically about 30 to 50 percent higher than non-members. And so you get the one two mm -hmm. punch of they're spending more money with you and um, they're retaining at a higher rate because they're they've, they've chosen to be a member of your site. So a couple of different things, ways to think about it. I would start with just some add-ons, which is like a really natural, like well-known playbook in the D2C space right now. Yeah. And, and, you know, com if you're comparing software to product recurring, um, we're, we're a software company, a bold, and, um, one of the key metrics that investors have looked at over the years is <clears throat> net dollar retention. And what that means is um, it's you can have a negative churn if your average customer is becoming more valuable over time because they're upgrading and going to premium plans. Even though you are churning 10%, your average customer upgrades 20%, you actually have a 110% uh, retention rate. Um, it's a net, net dollar retention. Um, and that's actually a very important metric. And I, I think that applies perfectly even with with product um and then i just want to highlight like i i totally agree with you on the membership side um i i it brands sometimes think that they're not a membership company like if you sell a coffee subscription um you think that you're a re a product your replenishment customers just want the convenience of the coffee once a month so you put subscribe and save on it and think that that's that's it um we um we put out we did a we did a report a long time a couple of years ago um we looked at all of our brands and we kind of tried to figure out all the different models and then the ebook is called actually mike or daniel if you can throw the link in the chat but it's the seven subscription models to master and it's it pairs down into three so there's a whole bunch but ultimately it comes down to really three it's replenishment curation and access and access is that membership type um and the brands that actually then we looked at all of our top brands and the brands that were doing the best all had an aspect of each one of them so they had some aspect of replenishment which is the the standard one uh an aspect of replenishment is just subscribe save curation obviously is some aspect of creation it's either a flavor of the month or chef, you know chef's or roaster's choice for that coffee yep. and then access is membership and i think every Every subscription brand should really try to think hard about what membership perks they can give their, yeah. their, their subscribers. And that can be as simple as exclusive products. Like if you launch a product, give it to your customers, uh, your members, sorry, subscribers a month before regular customers, give them VIP pricing, give them access to content on your site that other, other customers don't. Maybe you do a Zoom call once a quarter. You're the founder of the coffee company and you do a Zoom call and you talk about roasting the coffee and that's an exclusive thing. Or um, That's a really big one and I, I'm glad you touched on it because I think that goes back to your value point as well too. And if you, you say you can't track value, but um, that's perceived value. And if I 
have my coffee subscription and now I have three bags of coffee in my shelf because I was away last month and I didn't drink it. If all I'm getting is coffee and I have three bags built up, I might go and I might cancel my subscription because I think, well, I'm not using this anymore. But if that means I'm also going to lose my VIP pricing, my once a month, I get an exclusive offer for half off of another bag, my access to um, my, the community, the roasters community. Uh, if I lose all of that, like the partner benefits, maybe I get 10% off coffee supplies at this other store. I'll think twice about canceling. Um, so that's a really big one. Um, I, I'm, I very, uh, passionate about that one as well too. So I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that. There is one company just to kind of, you know, and I think it's, it somehow is the future in some cases with, with, you know, actual physical goods is i don't know if you've heard of bottomless like bottomless coffee but no so i haven't what they do i i just as soon as i saw this just being a subscription nerd i was just like this is the coolest thing ever what they do is they send you a scale right so this is my phone obviously mm. the scale looks pretty similar and basically when you're making your coffee each morning it just connects to wi-fi and it measures how much is left and then you choose do you want the beans to be the freshest possible, AKA you end up not getting, um, they might be a little late. Do you want them to be right on time or do you always, you never want to run out of coffee, meaning they're a bit early, right? And what I love about this and Amazon actually released, um, I think they called it a digital shelf or something like that, which is very similar where you actually like tear, you know, the weight of your post-it notes or whatever you're, you know, going to get replenished. Um, and I thought it was brilliant. I think it's brilliant because this is kind of, you know, I, I think on a long enough timeline, um, we move from subscriptions to recurring, right? In the sense mm. of, um, you know, it's not mm. like, especially for commodity type products where you have replenishment as you were talking about, because it's like, if I, you know, wash my windows with the subscription window cleaner, well, some months I do it too much because there's something, I don't know, this metaphor is falling apart quick. Other months I don't do it enough. And it's yeah. like, if you just keep sending it no, to I, me, yeah. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want it like cancel because I feel like I have too much because then I'm going to forget to order more. Right. Or I'm going to be in a bind and go, eh, I'll just go to Walgreens or the local store. Right. So I think that's, that's where, you know, if you really want to get to the future, I think thinking through, um, thinking through something like bottomless um, and probably you don't need to go there today because we're still such in the infancy of subscription e-commerce, but that's kind of a, a future that I think looks, looks really fascinating. Yeah. It's uh, probably a huge reason for churn is uh, you, customers don't know how much to order and they get, it happened, it happened to me <laughs> um, recently. I, uh, I tried my best to calculate it, <clears throat> got a bunch built up of um, Swiffer pads actually believe it or not. And uh, then my wife said, how come we have a hundred Swiffer pads? And I just said, I got, I calculated how much we use. And so I, I, I canceled the subscription and um, yeah, I think it's the, and I think this, one thing I'll say to this is I, I was talking to a brand the other day that um, sold um, uh, environmentally friendly, th their whole concept was to have zero waste. So, you know, like wooden toothbrushes, um, cups that were um reusable water things water bottles um so it's yeah. like every month you every month you get a a box of uh reusable zero waste products oh cool and um yeah it's great great initiative i'd love to, to do it my only concern was am i going to get like a toothbrush every month or am i going to get the same water bottle i was a little bit concerned and what i suggested to her was she should actually package it as a uh, 24 month plan to become zero waste um, because she probably has average life life uh, time or, or uh, subscription of, of like seven months. So if mm -hmm. she sold a in 24 months, Pat, you can sign up and each month you get what you need and you move towards zero waste uh, that that is a subscription model. It just expires after 24 months. But if your average length is seven months anyway, you're, you're net ahead and it makes more sense from what you're trying to do. So sometimes subscription models are a process to get you to an end. Yeah. Um, and so thinking, thinking of it outside of the same thing forever, like, like this coffee, I think. Uh, yeah. I you think can that, think about like, um, you know, even like bump boxes and there's some other like yeah, stuff it, in the, the wedding or the birth world, um, you know, that can get really interesting as well.
Yep. Okay, I got two more um, points here, and then I'm going to jump to a couple questions before we run out of time. But um, <clears throat> loyalty programs have had uh, one of the other st uh, stats that stood out um, was the brands that have loyalty and referral programs. Um, they had much longer retention with their customers. Yeah. Um, so I have some thoughts on it. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are and are you seeing this across the board with other brands? Like, I mean, with all the ones that profit well monitors. Yeah. So just want to make sure I understand. So this data is showing that the customers loyalty programs actually don't improve retention. Is that what the data is showing or am I reading that in the opposite? No, it's opposite. Um, oh, okay, cool. it's, it's, yeah, it's a little tricky the way it's laid out. Um, but what, it, what it's saying is, uh, I'll read the kind of the summary here. The amount of the time of the average subscriber stays on board, um, plays an oh, important component in calculating the lifetime value. So yeah, so that is Most folks on the loyalty program are staying more than a year. Yeah, correct that's yeah. what it looks like yeah so this is very similar to the vip kind so, of little rant that i had like very very similar like normally when you have a membership or like a baked in relationship it's it's not as simple as just like well they signed up for this they're going to stick around for a year right like there's there's a lot of lurking variables here but um yeah this is a really really big thing where um these loyalty programs tend to with the right perks have people stick around um and continue purchasing over time so yeah, I think this is great. I think um, you should have a loyalty program, whether it's paid or not. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things to do. So maybe this isn't the first thing you think of, but you should build up to this, at least in my opinion. I think too, um, touching on your point about membership loyalties is another good opportunity to uh, give higher rewards or higher redemption value for your members. Uh, kind of like what Costco does. You can have different, you buy a membership and you earn different point values when you when you shop um yeah. get it if you can uh whatever loyalty program you use if you can integrate it with whatever subscription software you use uh give your customers more points if they're a member it's just one more thing that i guess it does have a cost but it's a it's a it's a perk that probably has more value in encouraging retention than you give away in cost mm -hmm. and loyalty points yeah so i like that that's cool uh I want to grab, there was a couple questions that came in here and, uh, and then we're going to wrap it up. But if anyone has any questions, if anyone's just watching on the live stream, feel free to post questions. Even if you're watching this after it's live, um, we'll still answer them in the comments, but while I have, uh, while I have Pat here, um, two, two ones I want to jump into, um, what's, um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm just picking here. What, okay, what challenges stores uh, do subscription industry see, sorry, what churn challenges do subscription stores on, this is a hard one, they're not usually so much. Sorry, the wording isn't good on that one. <laughs> okay, what are, the, what are the, uh, some common challenges that new subscriptions face right off the bat um, that you see brands launching uh, early on? The, the question is, what are the common challenges new subscriptions face? Yeah. Um, that, yeah. So, so we talked a lot about the mechanical pieces, you know, credit card failures, reactivation, salvage offers, those types of things. I think some of the other challenges, um, and then we also talked about kind of like not understanding who the right customer is and the right product kind of customer fit. I think some other cha challenges is just around like tooling, right? Um, and this is like a vague pitch for bold, I feel, but like, it's one of those things where I think a lot of the tooling around making sure like everything's in the same place because you want everything to kind of talk from, you know, the beginning to the end. Right. And I think a lot of times there isn't the right amount of, you know, communication set up, thinking about that whole customer journey. And part of that's because you're not thinking about it. And the other part of that is you're not setting up the right tooling. Cause you're like, Oh, I'm just going to build up myself, which is a really cute idea in the beginning. And then you realize very quickly that it's like not a great idea. Um, so yeah, just, just a, you know, kind of a shame, shameful plug for making sure your tooling's in the right place. Yep. Um, I'm going to ask one more. There's a, there's a bunch coming in here, but we're at the, we're at the time limit, but I want to make sure I, uh, someone posted one right at the very beginning up in the chat. 
Um, this person has a um, it's a loan. He's a loan provider subscription. Um, but the gist of the question was: is eventually people earn their way off of it? I so the the question is: we are an online personal loan provider to near prime, low to middle income, without much income um, income slack. Success for us is our customers no longer needing to take our no interest loans, but I need to also recapture churned customers for the growth and health of our business. How do we balance these two objectives of welfare and reducing churn? I, I actually instantly thought of like dating apps when I read this too, because like their success is a customer no longer needs to use the dating app yeah. uh, unless they are playing around, I guess, but, Serial um, but typically, <laughs> yeah. Um, but typically that's like success as they move on, but they there's, so I have a thought on this, but what, how, well, how would you address this? Like I see it as two different types of churn really. So the core, can you repeat the core of the question? Yeah. So, um, they need to cap recapture churned customers for growth, but I'm assuming only the ones that churned, uh, not because they no longer need a loan, but for other reasons. Got it. So, so they stop paying the loan and segment them. Right. And then okay. how do we balance the two objectives? Uh, yeah, I would frame I it in the, in the frame of like a, a dating app. I think it's the same concept. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's the, the same idea, right? Like in within the loan, like making sure you're, you know, carefully balancing that line of like not being, a full bill collector, although you would need to use some of those, some of those aspects, um, but also making sure that the customer keeps sticking around and then kind of being okay with that person leaving. Cause I think that's hard, right? It's similar to like when we're talking about bump boxes and like some of these other products where it's like, it's not meant to stick around forever. It's meant to, you know, kind of eventually be done. And then you want to make sure they have a good experience. So they refer everyone else or the next time they need that item, the next pregnancy or, you know, loan or whatever it is, they end up, you know, coming back to, to enjoy that as well. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Patrick, how are you on time? I want to read one last quote here that you had in your book that I forgot to cover. Um, yeah, just, I'm good. No worries. Do you have another five minutes? Too. Yeah, I got time, but you don't have to worry hey. about the quote if you don't want to. <laughs> okay. I just realized I didn't get to this one yet, but this was the last one you had in here. Um, the best subscription brands typically focus on revenue as their main North star, but then break that down into acquisition, monetization, and retention. Acquisition is then broken down to pure volume of customers acquired at a given cost, customer acquisition cost and return on ad spend, et cetera. Monetization to how much customers are spending improving average order value, average revenue per user, and keeping customers around longer, churn rate, expansion, re expansion revenue, and retention revenue. Um, I'd, I'd love to uh, just really dive into this a little bit here too. So um, can you can you speak to this a little bit? Um, and um, we can dive into what exactly you mean here. Yeah, the, the basic idea is that, um, yeah, the basic idea is that a lot of companies, um, there's a lot of different metrics to focus on, right? And I think what ends up happening is a lot of companies, they, they either focus on the wrong metrics or don't understand how the metric they're focusing on influences either the main number or like the downstream numbers, depending on what they're looking at. So this was just a simple way of saying like, Revenue, aka growth, is the number one goal for most folks. But if you break that down into the three pieces of, of your revenue, you start to see like, what are the levers that I can influence? Right now, you're probably aggressively influencing acquisition right now. Um, you got a whole team dedicated to all these other things, but you might end up just by doing a basic analysis, seeing that you're lacking in optimizing your AOV or your average revenue per user. Basically, those numbers are flat every single month, or your your retention is not going or not going up. Um, and your churn, you know, is is too high or, or not going down as much as it should. Mm -hmm. And then if you realize that, then you can break that down even further and see, oh, well, our credit card failures are bad. Let's fix that. Uh, so on and so forth. So I think it's just making sure that you're, um, you know, as, as fastidiously as possible, as disciplined as possible, walking through where the pain is um, and then fixing the pain to ultimately influence the top number. Okay. So then on our last slide here, um, 
all this all this is really saying this is just a uh, data around um, average average subscriber lifetime value based off of how deeply a brand understood their metrics. And so this was multiple parts of the report. We looked at how they understood their metrics and then we looked at their um, LTV of customers. Obviously it's higher. So the more that customers understand data, the better their retention, the lower their churn, the higher lifetime value. Um, what are key metrics that every subscription brand should be tracking adamantly trying to grow reporting on every month um what are the most important things uh yeah so ultimately what growth looks like revenue looks like um i think lifetime value cac retention uh arpu basically those those metrics that we just mentioned at, at least at a high level and then like if you have a problem, like if you know you're you're either focusing on something or you're like this is a problem that we need to like figure out, then break down that into segments, right? So CAC, it's like, hey, our CAC is out of control. Well, let's break out our CAC by segment. Um, you know, what can we influence? Oh, you know, Facebook is all of it. You know, there's hard, let's break that down even further. Um, but it's just like breaking down the little pieces that influence each other, essentially. Yeah. Well, you are the master of data. If anyone needs to better understand their data, um, definitely check out ProfitWell, um, read their content, or just use their product. That's it. Um, uh, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Totally. Bad. I know we went a little we went a little bit over time. I for all of you guys that asked asked questions that I didn't get to, um, we took longer than I thought. So I uh, will answer them in comments or re we'll reply via email. There's a bunch of good ones that came in. Um, just to let everyone watching know, uh, we're going to be doing, uh, we had our last webinar with um, Chris George from Subta. Uh, this one was with Pat. Um, we'll be doing another one coming up in July on specifically food and beverage uh, subscriptions, which was uh, a focus for us this last quarter. So we're going to be talking to some food and beverage subscription brands um, that are killing it and pull some advice from them. So Patrick, where do you want to send people actually, if uh, anyone wants to learn more about ProfitWell? Yeah, ProfitWell.com is assuming, great. Profitwell .com. Yeah, I'm also at uh, PC, just my initials at ProfitWell.com. I'm going to be publishing some, a new set of benchmarks relatively soon. So if you want to get your hands on that, um, you know, just send me an email and always up for, for talking regardless. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we, we write about or record stuff on all of these different topics we talked about. So um, there's probably something we've written on the, the question you have. If not, um, I'll know where to get it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you around. See y'all.